Hello everybody, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, we're going to do part two of the Knowledge and Wisdom series. This is going to be more part wisdom part, but this is going to be on King Solomon, the son of King David, who ruled after the passing of King David. So, a little bit of background. King Solomon, if you listen to the previous study, asked for wisdom and knowledge to be able to rule Israel in the honor of the Lord. Very, very few people would ask for that. You know, most people would be asking for money, gold, uh, fame, fortune, you know, that's how it works, right? But Solomon's had a tender heart towards the Lord. And he says, I'm going to need your wisdom to rule the, your people properly. And the Lord honored him for that. So let's read. Uh, in 2 Samuel, two, uh, verse 12 and verse 24. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her. And she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. The Lord loved Solomon. How's that for a <laughs> something, right? All right. You know, one could do a many, many hours Bible study on just the kings of Israel, but we're just going to cover some of the, I guess you could say the high points. Turn your King James Bible to 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. So here it is, King David's pretty old you know it's been a long time since he fought Goliath he's been ruling over Israel and he's getting ready to be with all flesh at the end of days right and he charged Solomon his son saying I go the way of all the earth be thou strong therefore and show thyself a man and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Now, a note here. You had the priests of the Lord, the Levites. They were the serve the Lord. They were the ones that would copy the scriptures. They were the ones that would do the Lord's work in the temple, the sacrifices until Christ would come. Uh, those were their duties. The king also had duties. Uh, there were different sets of laws. There were the laws for the priests. Um, Believe it or not, there was a law that a priest had to wear underwear because he didn't want to expose a certain part of his body to the Lord uh, in the temple. Believe it or not, that was a law. I mean, you would spend, they would spend, oh, I don't know, 10 or 12 years just learning the book of Leviticus, how to do all the things, the, uh, the feast days. Uh, tabernacles, Passover, uh, those kind of things, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They were the ones that would teach the law and the statutes to the people. Now, that was the religious side. The king was responsible for the civil rules and laws, like a murderer, how to deal with a murderer. If you had two or three people that said that somebody killed somebody, and murdered, 
the king was to ensure that they were put to death. And if those two or three people that testified against that person was found guilty of lying, whatever penalty they tried to put on the other person, they were to get. Let me tell you something, people. People would think twice about perjuring themselves if they knew that they are, if they were caught lying, they would die. Think about that. That would, that would solve a lot of problems. So, you know, it was a very serious thing. The king was the one that would solve civil disputes. If it wasn't of a religious nature, the king was in charge. That's why in the last study, Solomon asked the Lord for wisdom to be able to rule his people honorably and justly. And the Lord honored that. And hey, it even says that the Lord loved Solomon. We just read that, right? All right, verse 4. That the Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. Now, some people will tell you that... Um, some of the kings of Europe are descended from Israel. I don't know if that's true, but since, uh, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if it is. But uh, Christ is of the line of David, and he is a king. So there's always going to be a man on the throne of Israel. Um, let's see. All right, let's skip uh, to verse 10. So David slept with his fathers. In other words, he's dead, right? And was buried in the city of David. And the days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron, and 30 and three years reigned he in Jerusalem. Then sat Solomon upon the throne of David his father, and his, a king, and his kingdom was established greatly. All right, in chapter 3 of 1 Kings, verse 1, And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter, and brought her into the city of David, um, until he had made an end of building his own house in the house of the Lord, and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Now, Solomon was considered the wisest man that ever lived, but he had married a bunch of heathen wives and when you read the um, some of his later writings he said all this was vanity vanity means worthless but we'll uh, we'll probably get to that later so verse 2 only the people sacrificed in high places in other words, they were some of the people were practicing Satanism. Um, only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord. And didn't it say that the Lord loved Solomon? How does the Lord love Solomon when he's just a baby being born? I mean, you know, that's... Oof. It kind of makes me wonder if our souls were created back on the sixth day of creation, you know, on the sixth day uh, or the fifth day. I don't know. I don't know what day, but did, Lord, did the Lord create all the souls before he formed our bodies? Did we exist in some sort of form with him? In the book of Jeremiah, it says that uh, he told Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. So, I'm kind of of the opinion that maybe we existed in some form with the Lord before he placed our souls and spirit into a physical flesh body. 
maybe that's why he loves Solomon and why he ordained Jeremiah to be the prophet. You know, I, I don't know. That's just my theory. I'm not saying the Bible teaches that because I don't know. But uh, I, I kind of wonder about that. So, all right, so verse 3. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. Now, by no means did do I think that Solomon offered uh, in the high places doing Satanism. No. No. But the people, that's another thing. All right, so Solomon goes to Gibeon, verse 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Now, we read this before, but, you know. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he has walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, but I am but a little child, and I know not how to go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may, be, uh, that I may discern between good and bad, and who is able to judge this thy so great a people. You see, when there was a matter of controversy, uh, the king would decide. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because, because, thou, hast not, uh, because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. See, he wants to rule righteously. So what does the Lord say? Behold, verse 12, Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all these day, all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then will I lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. Now, those of you that have never read the Old Testament, you're cheating yourself. Verse 16. Then came there two women that were harlots under the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. And we were together, there was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. In other words, uh, she rolled over and her weight smothered the child. Verse 20, And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. 
All right, so how's the king going to solve this matter? Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. The other say, Nay, but thy son is dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman, whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh, my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. So the woman that wanted to cut the child in half, King Solomon knew that wasn't the mother. The mother was willing to give the other woman her child rather than see it die. Solomon had wisdom, right? And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. All right, in 1 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 29, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, exceeding much and largeness of heart. Largeness of heart? What does that mean? He's got a big heart, right? Even as the sand that is on the seashore, and Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezrahite, and Heman, and Shalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were a thousand and five. Uh, let's see. Skip to verse 34. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. All right. In 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father, for Hiram was ever a lover of David. And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, Thou knowest how that David... My father could not build an house unto the name of the Lord, his God, for the wars which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. And behold, I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build an house unto my name. Now therefore, command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be with thy servants, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can, that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. Um, and it came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, which hath given unto David a wise son over this great people. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the things which thou sentest for me to me for, and I will do all thy desire according timber of, sim se timber of cedar and concerning timber of fir. Perhaps you've heard of the cedars of Lebanon. Well, they've all been chopped down, I, I suppose. Um, so you can keep reading this if you wish. So Hiram and Solomon uh, work together on this item, building of the house of the Lord. Now, the temple was built with stones uh, there was cedar wood in the house. 
And uh, in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 21, it says, So Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold, and he made a partition by the chains of gold before the oracle, and he overlaid it with gold. Now, when you read Matthew 24, where uh, the disciples asked the Lord what it would be like before the time of his coming, he said that, uh, and they showed him the temple. You could read that on your own. Uh, I've covered that many, many, many times in previous studies. Well, the Lord said there, there were, the, the, the temple would be destroyed and there would not be one stone left upon another. Well, when the Romans came in 70 AD, they attacked Jerusalem because the uh, you-know-whos rebelled against Rome. And the Roman soldiers set fire to the temple. So obviously the cedar wood burned. And the fire was very hot and the gold melted. Well, it's going to go in between the cracks of the stones. So they, they, they took all the stones and threw them all down, and then they scraped all the gold from off the stones. And uh, so that prophecy in Matthew 24, where Jesus said that not one stone would be left upon another, was true. Now, if the wailing wall that the you-know-whos love to thrust their pelvises on, uh, if that was the temple, then Matthew 24, where Jesus said not one stone would be upon another, is a lie. So you could take your pick. You could believe Jesus or you can believe the you-know-whos. Personally, I, I picked Jesus. So, But there was a lot of gold in the temple. A lot of gold. Now, eventually, uh, the Babylonians came when Israel fell into Satanism. And they took all the stuff out of the temple. And then after 70 years, the Persians came, which is the descendants from modern-day Iran. And they allowed... Israel to return, well, Judah to return to Jerusalem. You can read about this in the book of Ezra. You can read about this in the book of Nehemiah. Ezra was the priest. Nehemiah was the king. And then um, the temple was, uh, re well, it was redone in the days of Herod. And according to Josephus, a, a Jewish historian, in the days of of Rome. I believe he lived during the time of Christ. I'm not sure. But uh, he said that Herod's family were Edomites of Esau. And they were a cursed group. You know, Herod was the one that wanted to kill uh, Jesus in Bethlehem. Remember, he slayed all the children under, what, two or three years old or something like that. So the whole family of Herod was not very good. And when Christ appeared to Herod, when Christ Pilate sent Christ to Herod, Herod was asking Christ questions, and Christ didn't even answer him, not a word. So that's, uh, that's how that works. So... Some people say that there's going to be a third temple. Some people say there's not. I don't know. I'm kind of of the opinion there will because the Antichrists, plural, want to build a temple for their Messiah, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast. So, all right, enough of that. Let's uh, keep reading about Solomon. All right, 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 51. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold, and the vessels did he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. All right, let's go to verse, 1 Kings chapter 8. This is the dedication 
of the temple. Verse 1, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. Now, uh, the Bible calendar records that spring is the beginning of the year. So, you know, you're talking March or April. So this is, this has got to be summer. Verse 3, And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark, and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels were in the tabernacle. Even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that they could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto this his place into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. Now, there are some people that theorize uh, there were two cherubims, one on the right, one on the left, on the corners. And their wings covered, uh, I believe, a throne. Would you believe that one of these was probably Lucifer? Probably. Verse 7, For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the, uh, the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and they are unto this day. What's a stave? It's like a, a, a stick or a club. You know, they would put it in between some rings and carry it. Uh, nine, there was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb. Do you realize these are the Ten Commandments, people? The two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Now, some people will tell you this is the Shekinah. No. Shekinah does not belong in the Bible. It's nowhere. It's from, um, oh, the Antichrist. There's a word that's similar to Shekinah, but Shekinah is the goddess of the Kabbalah. So, you know, when people tell you the Shekinah, uh, they didn't get that from the Bible. They got that from someplace else. Okay, so that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand and minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Then spake Solomon, The Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee an house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of, of Israel and all the congregation of Israel stood and he said blessed be the Lord God of Israel which spake with his mouth unto David my father and hath with his hand fulfilled it saying since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt I choose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house that my name might be therein but I chose David to be over my people Israel and it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said unto David my father, Whereas it was in thine heart to build a house into my name, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. Nevertheless, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house unto my name. And the Lord hath performed his word that he spake, and I am risen up in the room of David my father, and sit on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, 
and have built an house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And I have set there a place for the ark, wherein is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or earth beneath who keepeth covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee, that walk before thee with all their heart, who has kept with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, thou spakest also with thy mouth and hast fulfilled it with thine hand as it is this day. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of David, so that my children take heed to their way, that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. And now, O Lord, I'm sorry, O Israel, I'm sorry. Verse 26, And now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified that thou speakest unto thy servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant, and to a supplication, O Lord, my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayest before thee today, today, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that my name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. Good thing the Lord's a forgiving God, right? Verse 31, If any man trespass against his neighbor, and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear, and the oath come before thine altar in this house, then hear thou in heaven, and do, and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head, and justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee. How many people teach this? Almost nobody. I hate, uh, I actually uh, hate most of the people that claim to be, uh, the ministers that claim to be Christian identity. All they ever do is complain about the seed of the devil. That's all they ever do. Oh, it's, they did this. They did that. They did this evil. They did that evil. Why? When thy people be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee. Why is the enemy so strong? Because our people have sinned against the Lord. Because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house. Then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they will pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin. Not just confess their sin, turn from their sin when thou afflictest them. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain unto thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. People, just because you pray for rain, you ain't going to get it. It says you got to turn. You got to turn from sin. I remember the Texas was in a drought and his church had, please pray for rain. That's only half the question. Just because you got a locked door and you stick the key in, 
That door is not going to automatically open because you stuck the key in it. You got to turn the key. Turning from sin is the turning of the key. When's the last time you've ever heard that taught in church? Almost never. Turn from sin. Verse 36. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain unto thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. All right, verse 37. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, what is pestilence? It's disease, people. You know, SARS, Zika, H1N1, swine flu, coronavirus, Ebola, AIDS. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locust, or if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward this house. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou, even thou only knowest the hearts of all the children of men that they may fear thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. Wow. How's that, people? That's the key. Turning from sin. That's why the enemy is so high above us right now. People don't get it. But that's why. And there's even some famous internet preachers one of them named Stephen in, M in Arizona that teaches, oh, repenting of sin. Oh, that's a work. Oh, really? I suppose faith is a work too. You know, Jesus taught repentance. And he, they'll tell you, oh, well, that means to change your mind and have faith in God. That's all it means. Really? Well, that's not what Solomon says here, is it? Turning from sin, that's repentance. Feeling sorry for offending a just and holy and righteous God. And turning to be more Christ-like. All right, in 1 Kings 10.23, we read, so, Solom so King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. Verse 24. And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom which God had put in his heart. All right. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 11. This is the bad thing. Verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians and Hittites. Ah, I bet you these women were very, very attractive. And ladies, you know, uh, you probably know, men look at the book by its cover, not by the contents a lot of times. Uh, I used to perform weddings. And, you know, men would marry a woman because she was attractive looking. And a woman would marry a man because he had money. So a guy that marries a girl for her looks and a girl, good-looking girl that marries him for money, uh, that is not exactly a match made in heaven. So uh, it's a match made in the other place, if you ask me. So uh, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Ammonites, the Zidonians, and the Hittites were Canaanite tribes that God said to destroy. Okay, verse 2. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, 
And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. That's a thousand different uh, women in his life. Uh, you know what? If you had one woman every night, it would take you two years before you got back to the first one, I guess you could say. Um, I don't know. Ugh. Boy, I tell you what, can you imagine having 700 women yakking in your ear complaining? I can't. So, uh, you know, a lot of guys think this is a fantasy. Personally, I, I think it's hell. And his wives turned away his heart. Turned away his heart from what? From the Lord. Verse 4. And it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, plural, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians. Ashtoreth is the goddess. She has many different names. Ishtar, Easter, Columbia. Oh, yeah. Did you know the Statue of Liberty in the harbor of New York City? That's Columbia, people, the goddess. Why do they call Washington, D.C. the District of Columbia? Oh, yeah. Because the goddess. So Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. And then did Solomon built in high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Molech was the god, the, the god, satanic god, that demanded child sacrifice by burning your children alive. Verse 8, And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. So much for being a wise guy, huh? Because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Forasmuch as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Uh, my note here, this happened to Solomon's son. Israel, the northern tribes of Israel, left Judah. And, you know, these idiot preachers will tell you, oh, well, Israel and Judah, it's the same thing. No, it's not. Israel and Judah had wars. They had different land areas. They had different kings. You know, that's like saying the North and the South in the American Civil War. Yeah, they're all Americans. But, you know, you tell somebody from Georgia that they're a Yankee from New York City, and uh, you might get a, uh, some chew, uh, tobacco chew spit in your face. Uh, you know, they're, they weren't the same people. I mean, they were all Israel, yes. But this is what happened. The Lord rent away the kingdom from Solomon's son. Uh, let's see. All right, so let's keep going. All right, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 28. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shulamite found him in the way. He had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. 
And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it, rent it in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give thee, and will give ten tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me. All right, so why is the Lord going to um, split the kingdom? Verse 33. Because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemoth, the god of the Mo Moabites, and Mil Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. Howbeit I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it unto thee, even ten tribes. And unto his son will I give one tribe that David my servant may have a light away, a light all way before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desirest, and shalt be king over Israel. See, Israel and Judah people are not the same, at least not in the Lord's eyes, okay? Uh, if you look at Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8, God divorced Israel, the northern kingdom, because they, they were even worse than Solomon. But God didn't divorce Judah because of the promise he made to David. All right, everybody, I think this is going to be uh, the end of part two, the wisdom of Solomon and, well, the fall of Solomon also. Uh, but the thing is, Solomon in his latter days uh, realized, my, I believe, that he uh, had messed up royally, I guess you could say, and uh, came back to the Lord. So you can read about it in his Proverbs, um, the wisdom of Solomon. He did a lot of writings. He really did. So, all right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And, this is, and that is Jesus, who is the Christ. In his precious name, amen.